Good evening to everyone here. Welcome to this evening's program. Thank you all for being here. Thank you to Surana College for making this possible. Um, thank you to the principal, Dr. Dina Kien. Thank you to Shivalsa at the Department of History and all the other departments and faculty that are here today. We look forward to this exciting start to this series of talks. My name is Deepika. I'm part of the team at the archives at the National Center for Biological Sciences. The National Center for Biological Sciences is located in Sarkarnagar. It's adjoining GKBK. And the archives at NCBS is a public center for the history of Indian science. We collect and preserve material across all STEM fields across the country. We preserve photos, letters, documents, scientific instruments, and other kinds of artifacts from individual scientists, organizations, people's movements, and much more. And if you'd like to learn more about us, please do visit the archives website. It's archives.nsbs.res.in. Or come and visit us in person. We're open to the public. We'd love to have visitors. We're available Monday to Friday from 10 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. And um, you'll see some of my colleagues outside. We have, we have tables arranged outside. There'll be snacks afterwards. We also have items. We have postcards and bookmarks from the archives. You'll see my colleagues um, uh, near a poster about the archives, and if you have any questions, please be, feel free to approach us. We're happy to talk about the work that we do. And um, for students or faculty from other colleges who are here, and if you require certificates of participation, there's a table outside um, to pick up your certificates. Please, please head there after this talk is done. And I'd like to hand over to the director of NCBS, Dr. L.S. Shashidra tell you a little more about the, the position of the Obed Siddiqui Chair at NCBS. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So first again, thanks to Surana Palesh for organizing this and thanks to all for coming to this uh, lecture of uh, Dr. Gita Chatta. And uh, so um, NCBS is National Center for Biological Sciences. It's a uh, biology, as the name indicates, is a research institution. Uh, dedicated to studies in the area of biological sciences and it is under the Department of Atomic Energy of the Government of India as the central government institutions. We have integrated PhD and PhD programs. Also we have a medicine program in biology and uh, studies and so forth. Now coming to when we do science, we also need to understand the process of science. Right? And when you talk about processes and methods of science, we have to look at from the historical perspective. When it all started, who started it, right? For example, if you are following a particular method, you know, what is the rationale behind this? How it all started, right? Obviously, you have to look at from the historical perspective. Also, when you look at a very specific domain in science, again, historical perspective helps. For multiple reasons, science, society, culture, history, all intertwined. One is for the you know, betterment of the science itself, so that we can do better science, we can study all of these things. And science influences the society so much, it's also important to know right, the genesis of whatever the discoveries are made, genesis of very different you know, foundational you know, uh, discoveries or foundational concepts that we have understood about the natural world. When we say natural world, there are two kinds, or rather three kinds. Natural world which has non-biological world, like all the matters other than the biological matter. Second is natural world with the natural in terms of other organisms, plants, animals, insects, microbes, everything, including viruses, which non-human biological world. And the third is human world itself. We are also product of the same natural world. We are also part of the same natural world, whether it is biological or non-biological. So we are intricately linked to Given this, what aspect of what we have learned about the, about the natural world surrounding us and about ourselves, right? How much is, is applicable to our day to day living? How much of it still need to be rediscovered or discovered or how much to be further improvised? All of these things is part of our discourse, right? It's simply not like we discovered this, this particular protein does this or if you rectify this protein, protein you can treat this particular disease, you know, how SARS-CoV-2 happened, how COVID-19 happened, all of those things are all some details. But really at the conceptual level, what we need to understand is 
the, this conceptual understanding of natural world, how it impacts our life, right? Our life is more complicated. Our life as we live, in terms of our diseases, in terms of our uh, you know, biological system, and also our social and cultural system. So in this context, it's also important to know who gets to do science, and what is the process in which very different biases in the society are eliminated when discoveries are made, right? So, in like the students of history, literature, economics, sociology, you all know how much a bias can get into simply because who talks about it. Similarly, in sciences too, a lot of bias can come in. Depends on who talks about the scientific, you know, uh, concepts. But the process of science over centuries has evolved in such a way that most of these can naturally get eliminated through a process what you call verification, validation, and falsification. But still, in the, the input, if it is only largely by, let's say, men, or largely by white men, obviously, you will input it so biased. Irrespective of how much of validation, falsification, verification happens, what amount of it, we'll have a biased opinion about our own world, particularly biological world, and our own social world, right? So it's also important to understand the, the intricate relationship between the sociology of scientists or scientific community and history of science to the outcome of scientific concepts, right? I mean, we always keep saying that science is about understanding ourselves, our understanding our surroundings, our understanding our world beyond human perception, right? For example, you ask anybody on earth, all the seven million people who have living today or all the billions of people ever lived, who has seen Earth moving on the sun? Right? No one. Because our visual perception, our mental perception of the world is such that it is the sun which moves around us. Right? But the science has proved beyond doubt it is other way around. But there is a methods of science. So such kind of discoveries when we make, obviously those are beyond any biases, because it is validated again and again. But still there's so much we try to understand, and, but those biases are somehow created. So we should form, consciously try to remove these biases, right? So many of these studies that we do uh, on history of science, of contemporary science particularly, in, in our archives, we look at such kind of material. Right, somewhere in the notebook of someone, somewhere in the letters written by one scientist or another scientist, maybe some of these elements will come in. Right? And some in the lives of the scientists itself. So we look at the biography of those scientists. So archives will collect such kind of material and people in the archives actually study this kind of thing. In fact, many of you who are interested are welcome to our archives and we, you know, researcher in the archives itself. And one aspect of the NCPS activity, including particularly of our archives, is the um, establishment of this obesity key chair uh, with a generous grant from DNQ Foundation from Chennai. And this obesity key chair, we invite people who are historians, sociologists, and uh, you know, and in a variety of different other disciplines, not necessarily from directly in sciences, but look at the science as an outsider and look at how this science is done. Where are the problems in the way science is practiced or in the way the scientific community in fact among themselves, right? So in this, we have Professor Gita Chetta as our uh, third obesity teacher and uh, so we welcome her and before that I guess there will be an introduction of her form. Thank you very much again. So to tell you a little about Dr. Geeta Chadha, she's, she's been the obesity key chair at NCPS, uh, and the position is for 2023 to 2024, so this is quite a wonderful finale to the year that she spent at NCPS. 
Um, she was formerly a faculty member at the Department of Sociology at the University of Mumbai. She has a doctorate in sociology. She taught at Mumbai University and the University of London's international program um, in Mumbai. She chaired the Women's Development Center at the University of Mumbai from 2016 to 2020. She has developed frameworks for feminist archiving at SNDT Women's University, Mumbai, and designed a pioneering course in feminist science studies at TIS Mumbai. Her research interests include science studies, feminist theories, and post-colonial studies. She has co-edited volumes titled Feminist and Science, Zero Point Bombay, and Reimagining Sociology in India, Feminist Perspectives. She has edited special issues for contributions to Indian sociology, the review of women's studies of the Economic and Political Weekly, and EPW Engage. And her recent volume, Mapping Scientific Method, Disciplinary Narrations, is co-edited with Renny Thomas and published by Routledge. She has collaborated with women artists and poets to promote feminist art practices in India. She regularly writes on these issues. And I'll hand over to Geeta to uh, who will be able to tell you more about some of the wonderful work she's done over the last year and over the course of her career. Am I audible? Is this working? Okay. Is this good? Uh, I know. <laughs> Normally I like to stand and talk, but I've been quite unwell recently and I'm nervous. So I'm going to sit down. I'm going to lose up from the audience on that side, but I hope you will be listening to me. Yeah. Um, so uh, let me start by thanking Surana College, uh, thanking uh, Dr. Shashidara for actually making it here and uh, I'd like to thank uh, NCS and the Dean Good Technologies for instituting I think this very significant chair position at uh, the archives and I think the archives is one of the best homes uh, for this kind of activity and it's been a pleasure to work with Venkat, Vipika, Anjali, Ravi, Ojas, Bhatri, Kalati, all of them and the kind of support that the chair's work receives is uh, quite remarkable and I must confess that uh, when I was invited to apply for this and also uh, offered the chair position, I was mildly surprised and uh, more than mildly surprised actually because the kind of work that I have been doing is quite critical in some sense about science and tends to get misunderstood as being anti-science. So for us, uh, people who work in science criticism, an opportunity like this was actually quite refreshing. It made me feel that uh, some amount of vindication for the kind of work that we have done over the last 20, 25 years in feminist science studies. We've tried to talk to three constituencies. We've tried to talk to the STEM constituency, STEM quote unquote, and you'll uh, know if you come tomorrow uh, why I put this in quotes. We've also tried to talk to the women's studies constituencies, and we have tried to talk to the social scientists because feminist science studies is actually interdisciplinary. We found an easier home in women's studies. Second easiest was actually in STEM. The social sciences are the worst, frankly speaking, to receive critical perspectives on science. Uh, so with a little bit of that, uh, let me sort of do something which is an overview. Uh, these talks are intended to be one lecture, three parts. So you'll see, I'll speak about the framework today and speak a little bit more about uh, specifics tomorrow. And I'll speak about something new that I've undertaken 
with the algorithm. Yeah? Uh, that's the way I'm sort of structure these talks. Uh, very quickly, uh, how many of you I know you students, I was just telling people as I was coming in, it must be terrible for the students to be told one hour you have to sit here. Yeah. So a lot of you might be here uh, because you have to be here, some of you might actually enjoy it. How many of you are from the sciences? Can I get a show of hands? Wonderful. A lot of you are from the sciences. Oh, applied sciences? All together. All together. All together. And how many of you are from the humanities? Okay, lovely. Uh, largely history, or do I have sociologists here? Not all, all subjects. All? All. Yes. Okay. So, <clears throat> we'll see how this goes. I requested Nipita that at the end of it, I would like a few questions. Yeah? So, I know that's a lot of pressure to ask a question at the end, but I hope you will. Yeah? Okay, so um, let me start by uh, doing a sort of a, so as I said, this is, the talk is contours of feminist science studies, directions that have gotten shaped in the last 20-25 years. I would say the classic text in feminist science studies, the science question in feminism, was actually published in 1986, somewhere around that time. In India, we've been working on this consistently now for the last 20, 25 years. A very small number of us. And we'll see what came out of it, how it came out. Now, when uh, Deepika was sharing designs with me for the poster of these talks, and you must have heard from Deepika that I have a slight investment in art also, in terms of how we represent things. And our artist, Ram Chandran, uh, gave us very lovely suggestions. But a lot of them were about women in laboratories, women trying to solve equations. Uh, and I was sort of urging her to think differently and not to show women in science only in those very conventional ways. And since this is a conversation between women in science and feminists like me, uh, I wanted to do something more at ease, at leisure. And this is a brilliant image that uh, artist uh, Megha came up with of playing with the idea of the Mad Hatter's party in Alice in Wonderland and basically showing women talking together, laughing over tea and the kind of images around science that they, this particular image brings forth is a kind of work that the, bi the women biologists that I spoke to actually work on. There's Umaran Krishnan's tiger, there's the zebra fish which Hatsila works on. There are different ways in which we are invoking science without it being something about equations and laboratories. But it being also about working in the wild, it's about working with the concepts, it's basically about working with nature. Yeah. Because that's what the NCBS experience uh, led me to. So I'd like to thank Thank her for that wonderful piece of art that she produced for these set of talks. And of course, I'd like to thank Vita for seeing what I was saying. Now, uh, I'll start with the methodological preamble, uh, which is what people in social sciences often tend to do. Uh, the methodological preamble is at two levels. One is I, as a feminist, what do I bring to the table? And the other thing is, I as a social anthropologist, what do I bring to the table? Yeah? So these are both questions of methodology. Now what is feminism? 
Uh, I've been warned by several people not to make this into an interactive session. It has to be a talk. So I'm not going to ask you what is feminism, but in your mind, I want you to answer my question. What is feminism to you? Now, feminism, uh, my conversation said in CBS when I came in, I was to teach a course, and I was struggling with how to title it. And I asked around whether I should use the term feminist in the title of my course. I got very responses. There were those who said, don't use the term. Because if you use the term feminist, there will be a lot of people who will not enroll to the course. They will get biased. There will be people who will cancel the course before they have even heard about it. Right? The term feminism tends to be, evoke very strong responses in people. It makes people feel rather insecure. It makes people feel that it's a perspective which is of healing men. It is something about hysterical women uh, who have nothing else to think or talk about except their own problems. It's a selfish project. Various things. Very often when I guide my students to write, when they're writing proposals uh, for fellowships, for grants, I advise and don't use the term feminism because I sat on the other side and I know how immediately the selection committee, the antenna goes up. So, in this context, a lot of us feminists tend to take this attitude that we will do our work, but we will not use the term. We won't use it as a prefix. To me, it seems like when women get married, they have expected to change their surnames. A lot of us do it just because it has to be done. Some of us choose not to do it. Very often, those of us who choose to change our surnames often rationalize saying, how does it matter? It's just a name. I'm not going to change. My autonomy doesn't get compromised. I will still be the person I am. Now, I wanted to break out of that kind of thinking. And at this age, and in the uh, chair position, I thought it is very important for me to use the term feminism unapologetically, unconditionally. Okay? It's an act. It's a very conscious act of using the term and not hiding it somewhere in the closet. Uh, what is feminism? We know it as activism. We know that it's a struggle and fight for equal rights. Is it also academic? It is, yes. Because a lot of feminists have brought in perspectives from feminism into the academia. You have departments of women's studies. You have departments of women and gender studies. Within disciplines, you have women working on questions of patriarchy, all of that. So it is as much an academic effort. I would submit to you that it is actually a consciousness. It's a world view. It is not just about women or men, but it's a way of looking at the world and envisioning it in an alternative, transformative, different fashion. So if you start looking at it like that, in some ways, feminism has a perspective towards life, towards the world that we live around us, can help us make sense of our own experiences, of why something is the way it is. And if that sense-making effort is actually empowering, it can be very liberating. It puts us in a box and we get, you know, ghettoized and we get uh, there are images about who is a feminist. Yeah? 
and those can be very off-putting for us. But at the same time, as a lot of you young people are here, I urge you to think about it in a more liberating sense, in a more empowering sense. If this time, we can talk about it. Contemporary feminism, in several ways, uh, brings in three, uh, as, at least that's the way I uh, present uh, contemporary feminism. One is to say, uh, we use the term intersectionality, which is very simple, which simply means, in Feminism 101, is that gender does not come alone. It comes along with caste. It comes along with class. It comes along with sexuality. It simply means that the way an upper caste woman experiences patriarchy is very different from the way a lower caste woman will face it. Often, the upper caste woman is complicit in the oppression of the lower caste woman. So therefore, Building solidarities across is a difficult project for families. Often, men of lower caste are much less privileged than women of upper caste. So the inequality exists on the axis of caste. Similarly with class, sexuality, and many other axes. That's our first principle of contemporary feminism, that we learn homogenize the category of woman as if they are all the same. The point is to be able to understand how women are constructed differently depending on religion, caste, sexuality, disability, that is a factor. This sensitivity is part of contemporary feminism. The other thing that feminism, contemporary feminism does is that it takes an, a lot, for example, from queer studies. Non-conforming uh, gender people have changed the way we theorize gender today. And it has actually enriched the feminist project to be able to learn and understand what gender non-conforming perspectives are telling us about gender. I don't have the time to go into this in detail, we can talk about And the third, more difficult one, uh, has been about engaging with masculinities. Traditionally, commonsensically, feminism is about the power of men over the power of women, right? But what does it mean to be a man in that position of power? Is it a comfortable position? Is it a safe position? Or is it also deeply, deeply problematic and diminishing for men? Does power and privilege actually uh, need to be questioned? A lot of men become allies of feminism while when they say that we will help equality of women. I always say this that the women's movement has shown that we can do it ourselves. What we need from men is to question their own identity and the way they are constructed as men. I hope I will speak about this on the last day, a little more than today. So that is the way I bring feminism to bear on the question of science. Yeah? I wish I could break here and say any questions. But keep your questions in your mind. Yeah? Are you with me? Or have I lost you? You're with me? Yeah? Okay. Thank you. Now, as I, uh, I believe the history department is uh, hosting this. Uh, the chair is located in the archives. And so therefore, there is a big presence of history as a discipline. When I came in here, um, for me, the most natural thing to do was to take NCBS as my field, as an ethnographer. So, what does that mean? I'll just read a little bit out. 
There can be historical explorations or there can be ethnographic ones. Mine has been the latter, both in my earlier work, which was an exploration of the process of creativity in the production of science and the strange role of intuition in this and how the genius gets constructed. In my work in the last one year and as the US chair at NCBS, I continue to use that ethnographic method. The similarities between the historic and ethnographic methods are many. Both are qualitative, both look at real contextual analysis, both focus on subjectivities, and both study human cultures. The difference is that while the historical method focuses on written documents, archives, artifacts, and records as sources, ethnography relies on conversations, dialogues, stories, observations, and free notes. The ethnographer participates in the field. Historical method uh, uh, focuses on the past and ways to reconstruct it meaningfully. Ethnography focuses on the present and how to configure it. I must qualify this here that in today's world where we do a lot of interdisciplinary work, these strict distinctions do get blurred, and yet these remain. Uh, and uh, again, his classic text, Thick Description, towards an interpretive theory of culture by anthropologist Clifford Pierce, who changed the way I looked at ethnography, for instance, because I, as a sociologist, often had a disdain for anthropology in the beginning. So what does Geert say? Geert says that doing ethnography is establishing rapport, selecting informants, transcribing texts, taking genealogies, mapping fields, keeping the diary, and so on, all of which I think I did. But it is not these things, techniques, and the seek procedures that define the enterprise. What defines it is the kind of intellectual effort it is. Gilles continues to say, doing ethnography is like trying to read, to, uh, to read in the sense of construct a reading of a manuscript, which can be foreign, faded, full of ellipses, incoherences, suspicious emendations, and tendentious commentaries but written not in conventionalized graphs of sound, but in transient examples of shape behavior. Geertz further says that in ethnography, the office of theory is to provide a vocabulary in which symbol what symbolic action has to say about itself, that is, about the role of culture in human life, can be expressed in the theory. Also, I often uh, uh, have to urge my audiences, particularly in the sciences, that, as Geert says, if you really want to understand what a science is, you should look in the first instance not at its theories or its findings, and primarily not at what its apologists say about it. You should look at it what, at what the practitioners of it do. In anthropology or any way social anthropology, what practitioners do is ethnography and it is in understanding what ethnography is, more exactly what doing ethnography is, that a start can be made towards grasping what anthropological analysis amounts to as a form of knowledge. And I found that my effort has always been about this. So when I am trying to understand biology or I am trying to understand uh, things and how they work at NCPS. My job is to look at what the biologist does. Similarly, I request my field to look at what I, as a sociologist, as a social scientist, bring with first developing a respect for what we do. Very often, I will be dismissed off by saying, oh, this is just anecdotal evidence. And you spend hours trying to explain to people what is the relevance and meaning of an anecdote. Okay? Especially when there are no figures, no numbers, no text, no data, no documents. Yeah. So, uh, my efforts in this speed project has been to do this with my field and also to persuade my field to see me as such. Borrowing, as I said, from Eka's artwork for the talks, 
I felt somewhat like Alice in Wonderland, except that it was I who was probably upsetting the rules in Wonderland rather than getting shocked by the madness of Wonderland. I was going in and out of shape, in and out, in order to fit into the doors and windows that opened up in conversations. Like in all ethnographic exercises, I carried the burden of the self as it gave the necessity, necessity of porosity to absorb the other, developing both an intimacy and a distance from the self and the other. Further, as a post-structuralist feminist ethnographer, what I found is that research is transformative both ways. It transforms the researcher, it hopefully will transform the field. And I must say that was uh, a remarkable process for me. I will talk about it a little more in the next two days. Uh, now let me come down to a little bit about the uh, field itself. Now, the origins of feminist science studies actually, I, feminist science studies is actually a very interesting interdisciplinary area that works at the intersections of science studies and women's studies. Now, what does this mean? So, critical science studies uh, is a field where, say, let's say in the post war period, a uh, lot of social scientists began to question uh, the privilege, the domination of science, its inherent moral value. Now this happened not just from the academia, it basically happened from the movements, the pacifist movement that questioned the role of science in war and the making of nuclear arms. It happened with the environmental movement, even today climate change is one of the biggest challenges we face and the kind of questions that we ask from the kind of science that we do. The women's movement which questioned the role of science in the making of patriarchy and how women's bodies are looked at, how women's uh, health is looked at. So a lot of the issues from the movements, real issues, led to a challenge of science, challenging the evident, natural, supremacy of science that the modernity puts up, enlightenment modernity, in which science was born, modern Western science. So the questioning of that is what is the first source of, say, I would say, feminist science studies, where uh, both uh, people at large in the world and academics, social scientists, began to critique and question science and its role in uh, making society the way it is becoming, yeah? Not necessarily positive, to put it very, very simplistic. In my own discipline, for example, in sociology, it took a lot of time for sociologists to actually look at science the way they look at everything else. So what, how do we look at things? When I have to look at religion, I will try to look at what are the social causes and determinants and forces and factors that shape religion. If I have to look at politics, I will do the same thing. If I have to look at poverty, I will do the same thing. But when it came to looking at science, immediately our idea was, no, science is a special case. It is not determined by the social political culture, so we exempted from any inquiry and scrutiny. As Professor Shashidara said in the beginning, it is influenced by social cultural uh, process. How does it get influenced? How does it remove that influence? Are important questions to engage with. But this privileging of science, a lot of sociologists also did. And I think we did that because if we question science, then we have to question ourselves because we also claim to be scientists. So in that sense, it took us a lot of courage to actually come out and develop critical perspectives to how scientific knowledge is produced. The classic book in the 60s was a book called The Structure of Scientific Revolution by Thomas Kuhn 
I don't know whether you study the history of science in this college, but it would be a text that I would strongly recommend you to pick up and just read. Yeah. So it is with this development of critical science studies that the ground became ready for feminist science studies to emerge. But it required one more thing to happen, which is a maturation of feminist theory. Feminist theory uses two concepts, right? One is the concept of gender, which is how do you and I become men and women? What are the ideas of masculine and feminine in the world that we live in? And the concept of patriarchy, which is the unequal distribution of social resources and power in the world between the sexes. Right? So, using these two concepts of gender and uh, patriarchy, we in feminist theory, in the early phase, uh, could answer this question as to how do I become a man, man or a woman? And the classic, as you, some of you might know, is Simone Huber's idea that I was not born a woman, I became one. Similarly, I am not born a man, I become one. Idea is to be able to distinguish between biological sex and social construction of gender. Yeah? We used our conceptual framework to do that, understand how we become what we become. We also used it to understand why is there an imbalance of equation between men and women. Right? Where is the hierarchy? How does it come? How does it get established? Right? But then we began to recognize slowly that the rule of gender doesn't stop there. There is a symbolic, silent, hidden role of gender that affects almost every aspect of life. It affects the way we think, it affects the way we write, it affects the way we do things. So when we began to realize that gender and patriarchy also influence the way cognitive and imaginative systems emerge, systems like science, systems like art, systems like religion, when we started family, when we started looking at institutions, not just people, as being constructed by gender, I think feminist theory would undertake the task of looking at science as an institution, as a knowledge making institution, critically. In India, I have added a third dimension. It's only when we could sufficiently and uh, squarely develop the critique of development and modernity. And even globally, when people began to ask this question, he, what is it that modern scientific development has done to our world? Is this the direction we want to go in? Whom has science allied with? What is the nexus between a capitalist form of organizing wealth with the uh, national race for arms and control with uh, people's lives. So when we begin to understand that the kind of development that modernity had set out as progress is probably taking us to a direction where we might not want to go as a species. And developing that criticism of the, uh, uh, of, of the development paradigm helped us in India, for example, when we realized that the development that was being put forward as scientific development, scientific management, the body, of land, of everything, water, is not really going well for women. And it was only then that we could make the connections between uh, critiquing science and what was happening to our lives. Finally, of course, post-colonial perspectives that came out from people like J.P.S. Oberoi, who basically said that the enlightened modern had reached its apex of destruction with the Manhattan Project, with the making of the atom bomb, and the promise of science that began, say, with Newton and Virilio and 
uh, 18th century science and all of that had taken us completely too far away from that vision and that promise and that dream and that had taken us to a very, very precarious world and a very, very violent world and through colonialism this was instituted across the universe. Uh, uh, and, and so as post-colonial societies, it became our burden and in a way our responsibility to come up with alternative views towards the kind of uh, science and development and progress that the modern Western enlightenment through colonialism had taken across the world. And there are people, for example, like JPS, who were deeply committed to Gandhism and at that point drew out alternative ways of looking at nature, looking at the world in a more uh, uh, holistic, integrated, less invasive, less violent, more sustainable way. Yeah. And uh, so these are the four sort of uh, uh, conditions that are very important for feminist science studies to actually were very important for it to develop as a field. Yeah? And uh, of course, when we came to post-colonial perspectives, we had a lot of trouble. We had a lot of trouble because you become uh, quickly pushed into anti-development, anti-science kind of a box and say that if you are critiquing science and you are anti-science, you are anti-development, automatically you are playing into the hands of the right. So it took a lot of time for some of us to sharpen that and say no, science criticism is science criticism, like literary criticism needs to be developed and we not be thought of as playing into the hands of the right because it doesn't. Uh, can we go to the next? Now, I'll spend a little, not bored, no? Bored? Okay. See, this is the difficulty with a one-way conversation. Yeah. Uh, but hold on. Whatever you absorb out of it, I would like you to put it back. Either as a seeking a clarification or as a contribution. Now, what are the contours? One of the things that feminist science studies has done pretty significantly is question what we call the ontological assumption. Any philosophy students here? Philosophers? So, uh, the concept of ontology in philosophy simply means what is the nature of reality. Okay? Something is something. How do we understand that? So, science makes certain ontological assumptions about nature. Okay? Nature is this, nature is that, nature obeys the laws of motion, obeys. Nature is often seen as she, right? So, she is nature, the scientist is he. This was something that feminists continued to sort of point out, that the way modern science looks at nature. And there are two very important thinkers that I often speak about. One is Caroline Merchant who spoke about how modern science actually looks at nature as a passive thing, okay, that needs to be controlled, that needs to be understood, secrets have to be discovered, so that it can be used to harness, be harnessed for the benefit of mankind. This is one assumption. And the other one, as, Kella, as Edwin Fox Keller points out, is it's not as simple as that. And she looks at Francis Bacon and the kind of metaphor. Very often I'm told by my scientist friend, what are you talking about Francis Bacon? 13th, 14th century, we don't care. It has no relevance. Once again I plead, saying anthropologists are interested in origin stories. And therefore this origin story is very relevant for us. So what Keller points out is that nature is seen in Bacon's uh, account, for example, as being wild, not passive. She's wild and therefore needs to be controlled. And this control, very interestingly, he uses the metaphor of marriage. Okay. 
and violence. A lot of what Keller points out is there's a lot of great metaphor in the way he thinks that nature has to be controlled, okay, in order that she abides by the rules or she tells us her secrets. Now, what feminist historians of science have done is uncovered this ontological assumptions and also shown how patriarchy at that period deepens and why nature is being controlled, women's bodies, women's lives also get controlled. Okay? So this connection is what we humbly try to show you. The other aspect of methodology is epistemology, which means how do I know what I know? How do I say this is true, this is false? So the scientific method has been the biggest arbiter in modern times. Our argument is that scientific knowledge is taken to be as the absolute truth, singular absolute truth, that can be used to contest all other claims for truth. Our argument is it is one more truth. It is partial truth. That doesn't mean we uh, write off the rigor with which it is produced, no. But the point still remains that it is situated by, as Professor Shashidara was, has recognized, by the people who are producing, by the purpose of, for whom are you producing, what is the goal of your uh, knowledge, why are we trying to find out the COVID vaccine? Of course, because we want to rid ourselves of the virus, but we also are under a lot of pressure from the pharma industry. Is the scientific community today, for example, free of that? No. It's better to recognize it rather than say, that's all outside. Yeah? So to be able to recognize that scientific knowledge, scientific method itself, probably produces bias. And there are many ways I can go on talking about this, which I'll come to in the representational question. Now, for example, our understanding of female brain, our understanding of female body, our understanding of hormones, our understanding of various aspects of life, Do they or do they not reproduce bias? People tell me that, oh, you know, the brain size theory is outdated. Right? The fact that women's brains were considered to be sawn or black people's brains, it's all outdated. Because we have changed that. Yes, you have changed that, but can you look carefully at what you are still reproducing and pay attention to the fact that what you are producing is conditioned by various external factors and not the purity of the scientific method. We only urge this much recognition that scientific knowledge is produced in a situated context. We need to recognize it as such. There is no objectivity out there. It is produced by actors. Okay? So it is not that completely objectivity is removed and thrown out but it is contextualized and given partial statements, not absolute statements. Now, when I started my journey in feminist science studies about three years ago, I was more for deeply interested in questions of uh, the philosophical questions, the questions of creativity. But soon I realized that it's impossible to not see the connection of those questions with who is getting to do the science. It doesn't take you much to go through all the websites of scientific institutions in India. You'll find the domination of Brahmins. You'll find the domination of men. Now this domination, how do we explain it? A lot of people will say it's the innate talent of these communities, the Tamil Brahmins, the Bengali Brahmins, all of them who are there because their culture actually supports it, they are genetically better endowed. We as sociologists reject that. And we would like to look at it more sociologically. And our argument would be saying that 
Uh, yes, there are reasons because they were probably the first benefactors of formal education, British education, and today they are probably the gatekeepers. And that's a difference. Okay, when a when a group begins to gatekeep, who gets to do the science? Who gets to enter the space? The signals are dangerous. So look at the experience of Dalit students in science. Look at the experience of women students in science. Look at the experience of Dalits if they have made it in female scientific institutions. Look at the experiences of women. When we talk about who gets to do science, a lot of women in science or the STEM constituency is constantly saying, let's increase the numbers. Let's produce role models for girls to enter science. Yes, of course we do that. But the question to also ask is, what do women who enter science, how do they experience it? Are they still going through gender discrimination? And unfortunately, but more realistically today, we can say that they all accept that despite making it wherever to the top they do, there is discrimination. There is more than discrimination, there is the imposter syndrome that they themselves go through. So just by bringing more women into science, bringing more Dalits into science, bringing more Muslims into science, bringing more queer folk into science, we do the task. But if the inclusion is going to be conditional to you fitting to this culture, now that you've come in, then you're not really being inclusive. And that is what is happening to people from marginal locations who are coming into science. Our goal, of course, is that getting more people because you have to make it more democratic, but our goal only is to hopefully uh, see a change in what kind of science gets done if people from marginal and diverse locations come. That is a really distinct future. I don't see it happening very easily. Last on growth is pedagogy. Now, women, girls has told, you can't really do math. Right? And girls who do math are generally seen, maths are seen as being odd. Yeah? Girls do very well in maths in school up to a certain point and then they drop. And then stereotypes start coming. See, no girls are good at group learning. They're not creative. Okay? Data that drops, drops, drops. Look at the universities. One of the biggest problems that the Nehruan environment did was to separate the research institutes from the universities. So research institutes do their science. Universities do their teaching. There's a lot of disregard for teaching in research institutes. And there's no space to do research in the university. Right? And it's a struggle. So much so that teachers have come up and said, we don't want to do research if I'm going to teach 21 to 22 hours. It's a human. How can I do it? Right? So this whole divide between the research and teaching has been one of, and teaching gets feminized. Women go into teaching. Okay, so it's a very interesting sort of pattern. But most importantly, it's the problem that in feminist science studies, which we've argued, feminization of teaching is one thing, but more importantly, it's the silos. Sciences, social sciences, humanities, strict divisions. Today's world of interdisciplinary liberal studies, there is an attempt to go beyond the silos. Okay? But where are the jobs when you go beyond the silos? Yeah? If you want a decent job, you have to do a science degree or a commerce degree or an arts degree. Okay? You do something in between, people will say, what is this? Okay? So we not matching it with the job market, for example. So what I'm trying to say is that one of the things that we've been talking about is interdisciplinary pedagogy. And We've been involved, some of us, in trying to teach social science to the science students 
and our experience has been quite interesting, including my experience at NCBS, which has been one of the most marvelous little experiences, where a lot of the science students came to begin with, and I'm teaching them history of science in a more critical way than they were used to. And they said, and I said, nobody your knowledge is constructed in bias. And they said, don't put this burden on us. We are only reported in the laboratory. You don't say we are trying to see color. I just ask them to wait and hang in with me for the course. And for three months that they stayed with me, I think some amount of thought went into what they do in the laboratory is not all unbiased, absolute, objective. They began to recognize the possibility of how social bias can enter into what they do. What I'm trying to say here is that they also became extremely conscious of the fact that what they do in a scientific research institution has impact on the society in which they live in. And that was quite an interesting thing to be witness to. And so what I'm trying to say is that in a college, for example, how often do science students go and sit in a literature class and vice versa? How often do philosophy students go into a science classroom? Is it important? Take it as a given. It is. It enhances the way we know what we do. Okay? And so this silos that we have made are actually creating a lot of problem in developing reflexive and critical approaches to science. So I'm going to end with that. Yes, I know. I just have a couple of quotes. For me, feminist science studies, so when people say you speak about your work, what is my work? It has been a collective. Okay? The networks between say Asha Chutan, who took over the course that Chenika and I designed at this and is being taught today. Her perspective, for example, she says, FSS for me is not about criticism but about critique. There is a difference between the two, which means alternative knowledge models. And she goes on to talk about the course that she designed, but what she ends with saying is alternative knowledge models then are no longer utopia. And transformation is no longer a social justice issue in the narrow sense. Knowledge and politics go together. So the idea of transforming science, recognizing that it's a political thing, is also a political act. Chenika Shah, one of my other very real collaborators, says the method of science and knowledge and thus produced are as much a part of the dominant values and politics of our society as anything else. The purity of the enterprise and the transparency of the mirror it claims to hold to nature are myths that are created by the dominant and this knowledge of the natural world is as much a cultural construct as any other human enterprise. There is no separation between science and politics. I'd like to end with my favorite quote of Sandra Hardy, uh, which will give you some idea about the larger uh, project of feminist science studies. And she says, all versions of the scientific worldview take science to be a totalizing thing, meaning it applies everywhere to everything. It has been assumed that anything and everything worth understanding can be explained or interpreted within the assumptions of modern science. So if modern science tells you evolution theory is right, the Big Bang theory is right, whatever, whatever then we have to understand everything through that framework. Yeah? Uh, yet, there is another world hidden from the consciousness of science, the world of emotions, feelings, political values, of the individual and collective unconscious, of social and historical particularities, explored by novels, a drama, poetry, music and art, within which we all live most of our waking and dreaming hours under constant threat of its increasing infusion by scientific rationality. Part of the project of feminism is to reveal the relationship between the two worlds and how each shapes and forms the other. 
that's really the end. Maybe you should start by first thinking, take up any popular film. Right now, your popular, most favorite film in your mind. And see if you can plot a very complicated dots to what you learn in your science classroom. See if you can do that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gita. And so Gita is open to questions. Um, I request you to keep your questions short, and we can continue outside. There are there's snacks and there's beverages outside, but uh, we can have a few questions. And I understand that some of the students here wanted to moderate this session. Well, I will. Um, <laughs> questions, please. Yeah. Uh,
inequalities are socially produced. Yeah. So I would say we are not really. I mean, if we were born feminists, then how do we explain patriarchy? No? And patriarchy is a social construct. Yes. Patriarchy is a social contract which leads to inequalities. But is equality not a social construct? Ma'am, it is. That is. So my question was, so now that we're born, we're not born with the idea of, you know, we're supposed, as kids, if you ask kids if a boy or a girl, technically, are supposed to be treated differently, they're, they're, uh, probably their responses are subjective, but it's mostly no, because, you know, it's probably yeah. because they're supposed to be treated properly. It's, it's also because of experiences that you're probably taught in school or in, you know, social, in the society that you're yeah. finding you're anywhere else. I get the drift of what you're saying. But I would say that people who actually construct patriarchy <coughs> are not feminists. So the contention that we're all feminists, we're all born feminists, needs to be examined. Logically, it doesn't hold. Because if that were the case, we would not see patriarchy. The fact that we see patriarchy means there are people who are not feminists. Right? But the fact what we are trying to say is that there is equality in nature. Or that there is difference, but there is equality. There is no dictum from either God or from nature to produce patriarchy. Yeah? Does that Thank answer you your question? Uh, partially. Thank you so much. See partially. Always partially. Good evening. My name is Vinod, BFI and here. So my question is, like, from few years I have a doubt, like religions, all religions are, to be honest, it's against the women, I guess. Because in Hinduism, women are not allowed inside the temple. Even in Islam, they are not allowed to enter the mosque. And uh, Jainism and Buddhism, there are no teachers, women teachers. So, but when it comes to, like women are the ones who are protecting the religion inside our house. If we see our parents, like mom, who be very believe on the God, faith on the God. So, what do you think about it? You are absolutely right. Religion is one of the most important uh, institutions that reproduces patriarchy and mental equality. There is no doubt about that. Uh, but to nuance it a little bit, if we, may, if we were to say it's not only religion, right? It's a network of institutions that produce it. Yeah? That's one thing I want you to remember. So when we put the burden completely on religion and say absorb science, then we are making a mistake. But having said this, so there, are, there is a need to reform religion, there is a need to question religion. In feminism, there have been very different ways in which women have related to religion. Feminists have rejected. There are a whole lot of them who just rejected religion, saying that it's the most oppressive institution. There are those who argue saying that it can be used for liberation, women's liberation themselves. Because it has also been the place and space where women have found expression for their own lives and their own memories. When nothing else is available to them, they find the expression. So how do we work towards understanding that? Women's own expression in religion, how they claim it and give them agency and autonomy. So one of the biggest things that women, women's movement, women's movements in India is fighting for which is right to tend to Right? Now you might argue say, <coughs> if religion is such an oppressive institution and temples are really such bad spaces, why do women want to be part of that? Right? There is a certain logic to that. Because these are all said and not centers of power, religion, science. So by entering into that, women probably get empowered. They probably do things to feel. It's complex, you know. So I absolutely agree with you that religion has been one of the most uh, significant institutions to be but we need to look at how women claim religion. 
So for example, there's a lot of work done on uh, bhakti women in same poets and how their relationship to God is very different from a grammatical orthodox uh, relationship. And they are talking about God in a very intimate, in a very irreverent fashion. And that's radical. So there is a scope for us to look at that. Yeah? So whether it's Akka Mahadevi, whether it is Anda, whether it is Janabai, Sohirabai, there's a lot of work coming out from women in same poems. Okay? Which, Thank you. Which brings us now. Yeah? Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, from the, this perspective, you just expounded for some time now. How do you explain the coexistence of the patriarchal societies, the Khasi society, the Jaintia society, the Garo society in Meghalaya, polyandry in Lahore city and the dark, and the patriarchal society of the Nayas in Kerala? How do you explain it? Uh, there's significant amount of work being done on it to basically suggest the following that while there could be polyandry and uh, polygyny in some uh, communities, uh, what we see is that there are different forms in which patriarchy sets in over there. So, for example, uh, women may or may not have the executive function in these communities. Often it is the mother's brother who holds the reins. So it is some man. If it is not the husband, not the father, it could be the brother. So point is not to say that these are not, uh, uh, these are as tight as other patriarchal other class society. They could be, uh, so that, that exists for example in religion. I mean, in Muslim person law, the kind of uh, uh, freedom relatively that women have is probably more than say in other religions. But that doesn't mean that there is religion. So that's why simple submission that let's examine more carefully and this whole idea of is feminism about replacing patriarchy with patriarchy? No, it isn't that. I think that project is over a long time. Ago. Yeah? So we might not necessarily so for example this entire question of control of female sexuality. Yeah? Uh, as you go down the caste ladder, the control on women's sexuality is lesser. No doubt about it. Because of the land is not at stake. Right? Low caste people at, at a certain level where there is no uh, land to be passed on. Sexuality is far less controlled. Now does that mean or in tribal communities, for example. Women's uh, autonomy is relatively more than, say, in non-tribal societies. Does that mean that there is no patriarchy? Unfortunately, no. You know? So we need to look at it in a segmented way, how patriarchy works there, if that answers. How would you deal with this? 
Yeah, I wish you would ask me the question about mortal science and sort of what is feminine. Uh, it's a critical consciousness. It comes out of a deep, urgent, uh, lived experience of patriarchy and inequality. Okay? When you realize that it is not working, you start questioning the system around you. Yeah? So, uh, unless you reach that point of consciousness, it will just be somebody else's problem. Yeah? So, people get defensive, people get insecure, people will label you, people will do all kinds of things. But, you have to do what you have to do. Yeah? Otherwise, the women's movement wouldn't have come here, you know? If we had got cowed down by all these kind of forces, uh, where would the women have fought for their rights, for voting, for example, for education, for equality, for whatever? So, <coughs> it will remain, but nothing to worry about. But collective is important. I think we realize in the women's movement that it's only the fact that if you think that only you are being abused, you're being abused at home, and you think only you are being abused and it's your fault, something you are doing is wrong. And you step out and you talk to five other women and they say, but it's happening to me also. And you form a collective to talk about it. You definitely are able to fight it better.
say thank you for having me and thanks for being here. So, 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 so,